I think we will start. Excellences, Recording members of in progress. the diplomatic community present here today, distinguished guests, panelists, good afternoon. And thank you for being here with us at this hybrid event on managing conflict in Africa, reflecting on the past to inform the future. We especially recognize the turbulent times we are in and know that many of the EU diplomatic corps are now engaged with this crisis. I am Professor Cheryl Hendricks, the Executive Director of the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation and Team Leader of the Gateways for Peace Project. This is a project which seeks to enhance EU-South Africa cooperation and coordination on global, continental, and regional peace and security, human rights, and governance issues. The first component of this project dealt with lessons learned in peace and security in Africa. And in this regard, we have held a series of webinars and this roundtable in essence then seeks to both reflect on the lessons identified in the webinars and the ones highlighted uh, by our panelists here today and to highlight the challenges and conflict management approaches to Africa, as well as to identify further opportunities for EU-South Africa partnership on peace and security. Certainly, events over the last week indicate that we cannot confine ourselves just to Africa today. The armed conflict that has ensued between Russia and Ukraine forces us to rethink conflict management in far more broader terms. I think that it has put paid to the often rhetorical observation that post the Cold War, we have moved from interstate war to intrastate war. We are now back in the throes of interstate war, one that is the largest conventional interstate war in Europe since World War II. We have now also seen a reversal of the norm of not sending in lethal weapons to conflict zones. Indeed, we are seeing a rewriting of some of the norms that have guided conflict management internationally and a revitalization of the European security community. As we watched Russian troops move in and Ukrainians scramble to defend themselves very heroically, very similar to scenes that we saw in Libya and in Ethiopia, except that those were intrastate conflicts, we were starkly confronted, at least in the beginning, with the limitations of our peace and security architectures in what they can and cannot do. But in Europe, there's now been a swift move to redress the situation. Will this be the case then for Africa too? If the agenda for peace invited the international community to take action to prevent disputes from arising between parties, to prevent existing disputes from escalating into conflicts, and to limit the spread of the latter when they occur, then we may have done well in terms of its implementation for a while, but this is no longer the case, and indeed, I think, has not been for a long while. We need a rethink. And I think that it's in moments of crisis, it's in moments of conflict that change happens. And so the time is now. We trust that this will be an engaging and constructive discussion, especially since the consequences of conflict on the lives and livelihoods of people are so direct and so severe. I will now invite Her Excellency Rina Kiyonka, the EU ambassador to South Africa since 2019, to make a few opening remarks. Ambassador Kiyonka was previously Chief Foreign Policy Advisor to the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk. She also previously led the Central Asia Division at the European External Action Service, and she also, held, uh, also led on human rights for um, EEAS. Ambassador Kiyonka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor Hendricks, and Thank you for what I believe is a, a very appropriate uh, introduction to today's discussions. Um, I'm delighted to see all of you uh, physically, and I know that some of you are behind the camera there, uh, cannot see you. Uh, but the idea of this, of this, um, this edition of the series is to discuss um, how we can uh, find places of intersection, as, as Professor Hendricks said. The project aims to strengthen 
um, EU-South Africa collaboration um, through providing spaces to discuss, to throw ideas in the air, uh, to workshop thoughts and ideas. And the idea, the aim is to try to deepen our understanding and enhance appreciation of each other's points of view um, and look for ways we can work together on peace and security issues through the strategic partnership. But the strategic partnership is, um, is maybe feeling a little bit fragile these days, um, at least on the question of what is happening in Ukraine um, uh, or what is happening to Ukraine. Uh, this is not a conflict between two countries. This is a case of one having, uh, one country having invaded uh, militarily and um, assaulted uh, another country that is independent and sovereign. Uh, it has galvanized public opinion in Europe. It has mobilized our leaders to action. And let's not forget that this all happened within a space of a week. Um, although this, this has been building for many, many weeks and months. And in fact, let's not forget that it's been going on for eight years uh, in Ukraine after Russia occupied uh, Donetsk and Luhansk and annexed Crimea. So this is nothing new, um, but last week's full-scale full -scale military attack by Russia on Ukraine um, demonstrates its disregard for international law, for the UN Charter, of which it is a violation of, uh, certainly the founding principles of the OSCE, to say nothing of the interests and rights <laughs> of its neighbor. So obviously the EU cannot stand by in this situation, and this is why probably there are fewer of EU diplomats here than um, than under the norm normal circumstances you would have because we're engaged in, uh, right as we speak, in a demarche on Dirko um, uh, regarding the uh, resolution that's in, going to be voted on in New York today. Uh, this would be a, a case in which we would very much hope that we could see our EU-South Africa strategic partnership in action uh, with the result of South Africa's vote on the resolution. But as I said, the EU cannot stand by in this situation. And in the past week, three different packages of measures um, have been uh, taken, uh, decisions taken in Brussels that target, target um, finance sectors, energy, transport. Uh, last night we closed EU airspace. Uh, we are closing down fake news shops that masquerade as news outlets uh, in the form of RT and Sputnik. And we have uh, possibly, uh, most significantly, and Professor Hendricks alluded to it, we are putting a half a billion euro for mostly military assistance, lethal, milit lethal assistance, so that the Ukrainians can defend themselves. Uh, because, and why are we doing this? Um, it's because Ukraine is an integral part of Europe. It always has been. It's a sovereign, independent country uh, who wants to join e the EU and NATO. And for that, uh, Russia has decided to um, launch a full-scale attack on it. Uh, President von der Leyen yesterday made the point that Ukraine is family to the EU. It's part of the family. And President of the European Council, Charles Michel, said that as we see proud and, and defiant and um, persevering Ukrainians uh, defending their homeland. In fact, they're defending Europe. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line for us. So we have called on and we continue to call on the Russian Federation to implement uh, an immediate ceasefire, to withdraw its forces immediately from Ukraine and to respect international law and international humanitarian law. And this is why we were quite welcoming um, when we saw uh, Minister Pandor's uh, statement last week, uh, also calling for withdrawal of forces. So let's see what happens in New York today. Meanwhile, the African continent has also seen uh, an intensity, uh, an increase in the number and intensity of conflicts 
uh, during the past decade, now accounting for almost half of the global total of conflicts. Ensuring long-lasting peace and security in Africa is clearly a shared interest, just as we believe in the EU that ensuring long-standing peace and security in Europe is a shared interest between the Euro European Union and South Africa. In our very first webinar last year, uh, we reflected on Africa's experiences in implementing the Agenda for Peace. A second webinar reflected on the need for a comprehensive response to the conflict in Mozambique, while a third seminar zoomed in on constructive ways of implementing the conflict prevention pillar of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. And as you may know, a couple of weeks ago, we held uh, the EU-AU summit, finally, and it resulted in a joint vision for a renewed partnership built on solidarity, security, peace, and sustainable economic development and prosperity. The EU-AU summit, it's usually, I've been to a few of these, and it's usually quite a um, choreographed affair with, um, with set speeches and a huge hall with 85 or 86 different delegations. And it, it can, um, uh, it, it, it's not maybe the most innovative way of, of talking from region to region. But this time, uh, we tried to do something different, and there were seven or eight um, uh, thematic roundtables. Uh, one of them was co-chaired by President Ramaphosa, the one on health and vaccines. Uh, and this allowed for much more dynamic, a uh, much more dynamic sort of exchange and, and um, sort of frank interaction um, on the challenges that we both face and, and what we could do together on these, on these different issues. But one, the, the one that President Ramaphosa chaired was, was on health and vaccines, but there was another one on um, peace, security, and governance. And uh, as a result of the discussions in that round table, uh, the European Union and African Union leaders agreed to boost cooperation on peace and security. And the summit actually resulted in a joint commitment to foster cooperation um, through support of adequate training, uh, capacity building and equipment, to strengthen and scale up autonomous peace operations of African defense and security forces, including through EU missions uh, and assistance measures, to support uh, law enforcement capacity building, and um, a number of other things. And as you may be aware, um, currently we've been in the uh, sort of crisis management business if you can say it that way, uh, military and civilian um, missions op and operations. We've been in this business since uh, 2003. We started the first one. And currently, um, of the 18 missions and operations that are deployed under the EU's common security uh, and defense policy around the world, of those 18, 11 of them um, are in Africa, are conducted in Africa. And what it means also is that some 2,000 European um, soldiers, police officers, and civil servants are deployed to these uh, different operations to train, advise, and collaborate with more than 30,000 counterparts in Africa. The EU remains committed to ensuring predictable and sustainable funding of the AU's efforts for peace and stability in Africa, as well as through support to the ongoing discussions um, on the use of UN assessed contributions for UN Security Council authorized operations. The EU is also engaged in supporting the AU to develop a human rights compliance framework so that peace operations are in full conformity with international human rights law and international humanitarian law. We also, at the, at the summit, agreed to cooperate, uh, intensify cooperation on cyberspace uh, to promote a global, open, free, and stable, secure cyberspace where human rights and fundamental freedoms and the rule of law apply. And our joint commitment to promote the rule of law in compliance with human rights and international humanitarian law remains at the core of our relationship. 
So I'm very pleased that today we will follow up on these discussions um, through this, this opportunity, this platform we have uh, to further exchange in South Africa on various pathways uh, to sustainable and inclusive peace in Africa, also in Europe. So I hope that we can draw on the insights of previous webinars um, to hear your reactions and your thoughts on the EU-AU summit um, outcomes in this particular area. And with any luck, we can identify also some um, future opportunities for the EU-AU um, partnership on peace and security. So I think uh, I would stop there. Professor Hendricks, thank you very much um, for the platform to talk about peace in both continents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kiyanka. And indeed, these are difficult times, not just for Europe, but for all of us globally. I am sure that during the course of today, we will pick up on South Africa's uh, current stance on uh, this particular conflict as well. And then outlining some of the outcomes of the uh, EU AU uh, summit. We are now going to move on to show a quick video, Ron, if you have the video. Um, from one of our webinars. Uh, if you can play that for a minute, please, Ron. South Africa's commitment to gender equality, the Women, Peace and Security agenda is exemplary. Every foreign minister since 1999 has been a woman. South Africa has reached the 50% mark for women cabinet ministers and has reached 46% representation in parliament. It also has uh, more than 30% uh, of women in the Department of Defense and Military Veterans and in the South African Police Service. Today's discussion is focused on the third pillar of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, that of conflict prevention. This pillar calls for the creation of a world free from armed conflict and violence, a world in which human rights are protected and women and men are equally empowered to take part in decision-making structures and processes. The overarching objective of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is preventing war and not making war safer for women. Early warning mechanisms are incorporated in South Africa's National Action Plan. Our country remains one of few countries that had substantive representation of women at over 30% at its negotiation talks. And this was achieved because women insisted that they might be included. Our national action plan reflects the holistic intention of the uh, UNSCR 1325, which is a measurable in instrument and includes specific indicators, outputs, and it sets time frames and uh, it sets our within a particular planning period. Uh, it it has gone through a participatory process. In fact, it has been a transparent process of drafting where civil society people from the academia as well as the pri private sector and government institutions were involved both in the drafting, in the validation, as well as in the uh, ultimate uh, adoption of the national action plan. South Africa has appointed its first female lieutenant general. That was the last year, this year, the beginning of this year. And now recently, we I think it's about two months ago, we also uh, appointed a new major general, female major general, which is actually adding the numbers. And it shows the commitment of the DOD. We all commend the South African government um, for advancing and ensuring that, you know, the National Action Plan is developed accordingly, but not only just developed alone, but developed in a multi-stakeholder uh, multi approach. I think uh, that should be commendable in, in, in the commitment that we all share and we all are accountable on. There are three main objectives 
uh, of women facing security. And it's not one or the other, it's actually all three of them. And they are peace, security, and gender equality. But the idea of all of this was was to, to, to build implementation. Everybody was frustrated because we are talking about 1325, we are talking about even the youth um, resolution 2250. Um, how are we going to implement and how are we going to do it? With our partners, EU, um, um, Norway, Switzerland, I uh, know Sweden, Sweden was also involved at some stage, uh, and get involved in the area where they can build their own uh, programs, build their own um, contribution in South Africa, um, and it all links to a broader issue of peace, and it uh, links to a broader issue of, of all the things that South Africa is known for. from one of the webinars were held on Women, Peace and Security. And as you know, Women, Peace and Security uh, is a commitment made by the EU, by the UN, by um, the African Union and by South Africa. We are now going to move on to our round table. Uh, in Africa, we have seen mass anti-government protests. We have seen the spread of violent extremism which despite external military ass assistance and interventions have failed to prevent the violence. Mozambique is particularly worrying, and even though Samim has deployed and other external actors have come in to assist with training and aid, violent extremists continue to attack villages. The number of unconstitutional changes of government that have taken place over the last few months are quite alarming. Guinea, Mali, Sudan, Burkina Faso, these threaten to take us back decades. The Horn of Africa has again seen major instability in Ethiopia and Sudan. And could we have prevented this? Down south, Eswatini and South Africa are also areas of concern as unrest threatens the peace of these countries. The upward trend in conflict indicates a need to revisit the appropriateness of our peace and security structures and conflict management strategies, and to see where and how we need to restructure and innovate to meet the challenges of the 21st century. In 2019, we, as, um, by we, I mean the Friedrich Ebert Stichting and African scholars and practitioners, developed a set of scenarios for the African peace and security architecture in which we indicated that APSA can become either an igloo in the desert, a lighthouse in the storm, a sanctuary in the sky, or an abandoned village. How it will adapt to the current conflict context, we are certainly not certain, but that it must adapt is inevitable. We are obviously now looking at what is happening in Europe and the responses to the conflict there. Uh, especially by NATO and the EU and APSA and the AU should draw best practices and lessons from this too. So our panelists today will have about seven minutes to make their remarks um, and then we will open up, up for a conversation. Our first speaker for the day is Prof. Anthony van Nikert, who is currently at the Witt School of Governance he is an associate professor, a well-known uh, academic in peace and security and, foreign, and the foreign policy environment in South Africa. Um, he was also appointed to the South African Council on International Relations in 2018, widely published in this area, and I know too on his way, if I may say, to the Thabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs. And he will address us on lessons learned from the Gateways Project. And then we have online um, Dr. Greg Mills. He, he heads the Brenters Foundation. He has directed numerous reform projects in Africa, been on the African Development Bank's high-level panel on fragile states and served as an advisor in Afghanistan, Colombia, and with various African governments. He's also the author of very many books. Uh, he is currently in the Ukraine, and we also then thank him for making the time to be with us. I hope he's still there. I know we will not detain him for very long. I said he can speak and then um, depart. And he will be identifying some key lessons we need to learn in peace and security, and some new approaches we need to adopt, and especially highlighting what South Africa could be doing. Then we have Ms. Lauren Hutton, who is a political analyst with many years of experience in the field of peace and security, especially in the Horn of Africa. 
she started her career at the ISS um, and she has designed conflict mitigation interventions and participated in many peace building evaluations. Uh, she will be addressing us on best practices and lessons learned in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Dr. Fonte Akum is the Executive Director of the Institute for Security Studies. Before becoming the head of ISS, he worked in the Dakar office as the head of the Lake Chad Basin Program. And prior to this at the International Monetary Fund head office in Washington, he also managed the research program for Cadestria, which many of us as African scholars have been associated with. So well-known African scholar and practitioner. And he will be speaking to us on implications of the return of the coup phenomenon in Africa. Last but not least is Ms. Faith Maberia, a senior researcher at the Institute for Global Dialogue, where she oversees their foreign policy analysis program. She has published widely and is a regular commenter on, commentator on foreign policy issues and not conflict. And I know been part of the development of the scenarios that I, I, spake, I spoke to. And today she will speak to us on the role of external actors in peace and security on the continent. Without further ado, I'm 20. So, um, because we want a conversation going. Oh. Yep. Oh. We have put in place in Africa the frameworks, the structures, and the processes for peace and security globally and and then on the continent, mm -hmm. why do we seem to be having an increase in conflict? Yeah. Why are we continuously in firefighting mode? Where are the gaps and what are the lessons to be learned? The floor is yours. Yeah, that's called an ambush, really. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> let me start by saying it's nice to be here with uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, difficult days ahead. I feel like I'm sitting in one of those AUEU summits. You know, I can, I can hardly see your auntie over there. <laughs> Uh, it's like Putin with his generals, you know, there's a vast distance. But I, I hope we're going to warm up to the conversation. Uh, it's, it's difficult to answer these questions in summary format because the, com the, the conflicts in Africa are complex. And solutions will have to take um, into consideration uh, the enormous complication and interrelatedness of so many factors. And if I have seven minutes, I'm going to tell you about some of those. Um, as you've heard before from the ambassador and from, from the chair, we've had three engagements so far. One on, let's say, the security architecture continentally. Uh, the second one on uh, women, peace, and security. And the third one on, um, <clears throat> I've written here, um, the insurgency in Cabo Delgado Pierce. Would that be the correct term? Uh, let's call it violent extremism in Cabo Delgado. Insurrection. Okay, that's, we can discuss that then. So my, my overall four conclusions to start with is, and the clock is now ticking, I know, um, is the first observation is we must continue to focus on conflict prevention. Despite progress, much more can be done to implement this in practice. Um, this applies to different agendas, sustaining peace, women, peace and security, extremism, and also the mechanisms used to achieve this, the so-called APSA and the NAPS, African Peace and Security Architecture, APSA, national action plans for all sorts of things, including VE, which is violent extremism. Um, and I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, I heard Minister Pandor on her way to... Geneva. How do you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> uh, if, if our foreign minister says this APSA thing is not really working, is it? It means we have to rethink it fundamentally. And Cheryl has opened the door. And that's one of the reasons we have this conversation. Secondly, civil society plays a key role in conflict prevention, including early warning, but also in providing holistic and multifaceted strategies to address the root causes of conflict. Third, key ongoing challenges include the domestication of AU frameworks, the need to develop comprehensive national and regional frameworks, for example, on violent extremism in Mozambique and at the AU level, and resourcing. And then finally, on this general point, coordination among different partners is key. 
This speaks to developing a shared sense of objectives beyond coordination on the ground. So uh, let me then turn to those three um, uh, engagements that we had and make some key points and maybe what we can learn from them. So on conflict prevention at continental level, uh, the following key points. Increasingly, the UN and the AU are focused on building a culture of conflict prevention and addressing root causes of conflict. And as I've said, the AU has established the APSA and developed mechanisms within this to enhance conflict prevention. And so conflict prevention is getting institutionalized and professionalized. But despite this, the AU continues to operate in firefighting mode. Uh, we can note some successes and failures. Uh, early warning, developed useful outputs for the chairperson of the AU and the Peace and Security Council. But the, uh, the merger in 21 of the uh, Peace and Security and Political Affairs um, departments left this role unclear. Harmonization between the AU and Rex and regional economic communities has improved with the signing of memorandums, memoranda of understanding. They're up for renegotiation if you want, and maybe you should ask the question whether MOUs lead to action on the ground. Uh, the next point is that civil society increasingly plays an, in early, plays an early warning role, especially in West Africa, and is being integrated into regional structures. But preventive diplomacy, Panel of the Wise, Envoys, Panwise, Femwise Africa, find that operationalization is difficult and is being challenged by administrative, financial, and technical capacity constraints. And then a heavy reliance on external partners continues to dominate the AU's efforts despite efforts at financial reform. What should, the, what should South Africa and the EU do differently? First, develop common approaches to conflict prevention. Secondly, assist member states to, to domesticate AU instruments and encourage SADC member states to comply with the ACDEG. Faith, can you remember what it stands for? The African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance. Governance. Okay. Promote the APRM, the African Peer Review Mechanism, and organize a lessons learned and best practice exercise. Support the SADC Mediation Support Unit and increase funding ambassador under the African Peace Facility. On Women, Peace and Security, you just saw the video, so I'll try to keep it uh, compact. Key points, South Africa has been a key driver of the UWPS agenda. It has developed a national action plan with priority areas, and it calls for the establishment of a national peace center as a knowledge hub uh, to do various things. And this plan will be popularized and disseminated. Partnerships, including the role of civil society and youth, are key to implementing the NAP. And the EU and South Africa have agreed to strengthen collaboration on the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the NAP. South Africa focuses on the conflict prevention pillar of the WPS and has developed early warning mechanisms and has been active in empowering women domestically and has driven this agenda in multilateral forums. South African women have a long history of peace building. Durko, our Foreign Affairs Department, Durko, has developed training programs for peacekeepers, whilst our Department of Defense has played a role in implementing the NAP. And the EU's action plan on gender equality and women's empowerment in external action 21 to 25 focuses on engaging with civil society organizations and peace negotiations, forming partnerships and developing collaborative, innovative solutions. What should South Africa and the EU do differently? There's a roadmap that spells out five or six points. Uh, joint high-level regional dialogue on civil military relations, collaboration um, on activities in Mozambique, support for gender mainstreaming in the DOD, including training, support for the implementation of our own national action plan, and the EU could strengthen women's movements and in building a peace center of excellence. Uh, lastly, the insurgency 
uh, or insurrection or violent extremism in Cabo Delgado in northern Mozambique. Key points, violent extremism has risen and continues to rise in Mozambique's Cabo Delgado province. The drivers include exclusion, marginalization, poverty, unemployment, and low levels of development. A military approach is therefore unlikely to address the root causes of conflict. The United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy is complemented by the UN's 2015 Plan of Action on Violent Extremism, extremism which stresses the need to develop regional and national action plans on violent extremism and to strengthen ca preventive capacities of member states. However, it is unclear how the AU's focus on conflict prevention applies to violent extremism. Some regional economic communities have, development, have developed the prevention of violent extremism strategies, such as ECOWAS and IGAT, but SADC has not yet done so. The Mozambican military has had a number of successes with the support of SADC, Rwanda, and the EU, with gains in seizing insurgent strongholds, equipment, etc. However, there are continued weaknesses. At developmental level, the Mozambican government established the Integrated Development Agency of the North, ADIN, which lacks capacity and funding, and maybe credibility. DDR, uh, demobilization, de one, one minute left, de demilitarization, de demobilization, and reintegration of former combatants um, is a key issue to be addressed in Mozambique, but also I think in, in many other conflict areas in Africa, uh, including South Africa, uh, since many combatants are left alone or have been set free due to an ineffective justice system. Humanitarian assistance is fraught with tensions over the roles of different actors. Um, the, ro the work of religious leaders, traditional and community leaders, and civil society are challenged by resourcing and a restrictive state atmosphere. And thus the government has been unable to develop in uh, the view of this uh, webinar, a multifaceted and preventative approach to violent extremism. Finally, Chair, what should South Africa and the EU do differently? Uh, we identified the need for further research to fill gaps, including on DDR and civil military relations. Uh, we propose the development of an exchange program on PCVE, on the prevention and countering of violent extremism between Mozambican and Southern African academics and think tanks and their counterparts in the EU. Third, develop shared objectives between the Mozambican government and foreign partners. Four, support peace building and transitional justice strategies. Finally, perhaps most crucially for now, develop a holistic strategy that could be implemented through a central and well-resourced multi-stakeholder platform. Thank you very much. I know you had a tall order to try and condense three webinars uh, into seven minutes. I think you did a good job um, focusing both on um, some of the key points that came out, but then also on um, the roadmap for EU-South Africa partnership. There are two policy briefs in circulation um, that also were produced uh, out of this, these webinars, please do read them. I do not want to keep Greg on the line for too long, so if we can see Greg, please, one. Greg, um, from your vantage point of being engaged in Afghanistan and Ukraine and your work in Africa, what do you think we are doing right in terms of the provision of peace and security? What do we need to rethink and what do we need to absolutely stop doing and why? Where can South Africa best intervene and through which types of intervention? What can South Africa bring to the table in the current conflict context? Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, just a correction, I'm not in Ukraine, I'm in Warsaw, uh, which is probably a whole lot better than Kiev right at the moment. Uh, I was supposed to be in Ukraine last week, but unfortunately, Mr. Putin had different ideas. Um, 
but I am uh, close enough and was at the border area much of the weekend. Um, let me try and answer your 70 minute question uh, in seven minutes by making three sets of three points. So even I can follow it. Um, uh, and let me say um, that being in Central or Eastern Europe and having uh, the ambassador on the other end does remind us of the dividends of peace uh, and the opportunity that this presents uh, for development. And of course, she will know better than anybody, despite her place of birth, um, the benefits of peace uh, in Eastern Europe, um, including in the Baltics, and the threat of that conflict has to that upward trajectory. Uh, and I think that more than anything else makes that point most profoundly. This is a very different area of the world to what it was 30 years ago, and that is the generation that is required to take it from one system to another. Let me um, make three points, as I said, about firstly, some basic facts. Secondly, uh, to raise three questions. And thirdly, to make three pointers. Let me just highlight those three statistics right at the very beginning. And I think that these more than anything else are going to drive the African security trajectory in one direction or the other over the next generation. The first of these is very simply and obviously population growth. This is a continent which uh, faces uh, rapid uh, population change. Uh, our demography is going from 1.2 billion people today to an estimated by the median UN projection, 2.5 billion people by the year 2050. These people are increasingly connected uh, to global communications. Uh, and uh, just by way of making that point, uh, there are today an estimated 5 billion internet users globally, and the average internet user spends almost seven hours online each day. And 70, nearly 70% 70 of the global population uh, of 8 billion users of social media, uh, sorry, it's nearly 70% of the global population of 8 billion users social media. Um, and the average use of social media is some two and a half uh, hours every day, totaling 10 billion hours daily. This is a big game changer in terms of the setting of aspirations, uh, but also in terms uh, of um, the way in which we address security globally. The third point I would make is, is really that uh, Africa's share, however, perhaps because of its population increase, has fallen, our share of global GDP has fallen quite dramatically over the last uh, 60 years of independence. So at the time of independence, around 1960, the average African, if such a thing exists, but measured statistically, uh, was roughly, had roughly 30% of the wealth of the average person globally. Today, that has fallen to around half of that figure, whereas Asia, for example, which, in which uh, the figure was very similar in 1960, has gone to more than 100% of the average growth uh, per capita, sorry, average GDP per capita. So Africans are half as wealthy today, measured by global terms, uh, than they were back in 1960. This now, these three statistics raise three big questions, for me at least. And the first of these is, what are likely to be the points of intersection between the global, the world outside of Africa and Africa in the security domain uh, and in the development domain over the next generation? What do conflicts like Afghanistan and differently, very differently, Ukraine teach us about security. You made some points early on, Cheryl, about inter and intrastate war. But what does Afghanistan teach us about external efforts to bring different forms of governance and security uh, into a foreign, if I can term it that, at least from the provider's perspective, milieu? And what do we have to bear in mind when attempting these sorts of changes, which are necessary, at least in the eyes of the provider, 
to be able to bring about systemic change within these societies. When is resource allocation the most apposite means of, of delivering security? And when is policy the most apposite method by which that resource allocation is delivered? And then finally, another question would be what strategies for growth and development are there which are most likely to take root uh, and which intersect most um, productively in terms of security? What are the, the sorts of strategies that we can learn from uh, around the world and indeed learning from our mistakes and then backdrop uh, is the latest book which I've just done which is called Expensive Poverty which the title gives away as a critique of aid over the last 30 years and the post-Cold War generation of aid giving. What have we learned from this and how can we better deliver effect, not just developmentally, but also in terms of the security sector? Let me make three pointers in the last couple of minutes that I have. The first of these is I believe that this is going to be a world less generous still than the worlds that have gone before. I do think the short-term effect of what's happened in Ukraine, coupled with the compounding effect of what happened in Afghanistan, is going to make the world to some extent turn inward. For example, where is Germany going to find its extra 100 billion euro a year that it's now committed to defense expenditure from? It's not simply going to come out of printing money, given the European context, it can't do what the United States does, uh, certainly it'll have to borrow, presumably, to affect that, but there's some things which are going to have to give. Um, I think this also means that there's going to be a degree of inward focus to diplomacy. There's going to be less concern for other areas of the world than the Europe's near abroad, rather than that further afield, such as in Africa. And I think the same is true to a certain extent for the United States as well. The second point I would make is one about where sources of insecurity really exist. What, what are going to be the solutions, and they're dependent really on what the sources of security are. I do believe that security, defined whether this is of state people over Africa, uh, in Africa of the next generation, will reflect several com a combination of several factors one of these as i've already pointed out is demography another of these is democratic conditions and the pace of economic growth and there's a inextricable uh, unfortunately for the naysayers empirical linkage between the two uh, it will also reflect the strength of local and regional governance structures and the willingness of these structures to adapt to realities um, in, uh, along with several extraneous factors, including uh, outside actors that I've already uh, pointed out about, uh, uh, in this regard, um, uh, and, and, and other influences such as uh, uh, the extent of, of radicalism uh, um, of various faiths and various types and varieties. I do think it's fundamentally important to distinguish between the causes of such failure um, which produce insecurity, such as the nature of the state itself, for example, and the relationship between government and the governed, and the symptoms, which include weak governance, corruption, intercommunal violence, low investment and growth, and so on. We often confuse those symptoms with being the causes of conflict. And I do believe that Africa's long-term failure to manage conflict relates to a fundamental inability at its very core to create a state governance model which is capable of meeting citizens' needs uh, and to also free up the economic system in a manner which allows for greater choice, greater growth, and thus wider inclusion. And fundamentally, the problem is, uh, for me at least, is that the pursuit of narrow elite-based interests has a bearing uh, on the economic opportunities which exist. And these are influenced by very deep-rooted factors 
including the history of state construction internally and externally in Africa and the related distribution of authority and power. And so in this fundamentally how to stand up, how to get going with an effective reformist state is a very big question. It's much easier to identify the type of relationship uh, that produces better long-term outcomes. And in a word, that's representative government or democracy. Getting to that state is much tricky, trickier, not least given uh, global democratic uh, recession or regression. And the third point I would make in all of this thus, and final point, is that political leadership is, is thereby at a premium to develop a narrative, and that narrative is massively important given all of what I've said before, a narrative of development, a narrative of diplomacy, a narrative of inclusion, a narrative of growth that everybody can identify with, and that actually gives expression to these otherwise sort of general comments about education, women's rights, which we know are fundamental to the transformation of society. And if you correlate levels of insecurity in the Sahel with women's education, it produces some fantastically interesting uh, outcomes, uh, which are very as predictable as they are perplexing, because if we know so obviously the sources of these insecurity and the solutions that are within our grasp, um, we should uh, seemingly be able to, to change them. So I would just in conclusion, which is my fourth point perhaps, say we need a different currency for security. It's fundamentally about politics and economics, not about money or technical assistance. And fundamentally, and I think this is for me the greatest lesson of all, um, and it's one that to some extent has been learned in Afghanistan, where Cheryl pointed out I spent far too long a time, but one that's been learned, I think, from Afghanistan and what you've seen over the last two or three weeks and particularly over the last three or four days to do with Ukraine, it places an absolute premium on leadership and on diplomacy to get these things right. And, and what diplomacy is about fundamentally is about calibrating very carefully your response to the circumstances that you face. And I think where the world outside has been extraordinarily weak is in making that calibration possible. It's played the same old game in Africa, which is you pretend to do one thing and we'll pretend to give you money far too long. And a much clearer calibration between cause and outcome is necessary to produce the security deliverables that we want. And as I've said, they go to the heart of politics to the heart of diplomacy and the heart of the growth model, which goes way beyond simply redistribution to real growth and development um, uh, and way beyond just the amount of money flows uh, in the offering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, and as you could see behind him, Greg's latest book, um, Defense of Poverty is out there and he's speaking to some of the issues raised so noting that the world will be less generous, uh, noting that we need to distinguish between the causes and symptoms of our long-term failure to manage conflict, refocus on state society relations, refocus on political leadership, and on leadership and diplomacy, and, and indicating the need for a different currency for security. We are now going to move on to Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. We, we, so, as I indicated, we had thought we had resolved the crises in the Horn of Africa. What did we miss uh, in relation to Ethiopia and Sudan that took us right back to interstate conflict? What did we do wrong? So, and what can South Africa bring to the table as well? Thanks, Cheryl. Um, it's very useful going after Greg because he's just answered all of those questions. Um, and I'm going to say a lot of things that were along the same line um, of what he was speaking about there. Uh, we do have just a few slides whenever you have them ready there, please. Um, I'm going to talk, I asked Cheryl to talk about the Horn of Africa, but I'm actually going to focus a little bit more just on the Sudans. 
um, because a lot of the lessons weren't around conflict management and around the use of peace agreements and negotiations to address conflict really come from these countries. And, and for the sake of brevity, I thought I'd just focus on that. Sometime back in 2014, just at the start of the civil war in South Sudan, I was having a conversation in Pretoria with um, a, a representative from the South African government around what South Africa should be doing in South Sudan. And at one point, the, the question I posed was, well, what is South Africa's desired outcome for the conflict in South Sudan? What, what is the, the policy position that is being sought? And the answer was that South Africa was seeking a Zimbabwe-style resolution to the conflict in South Sudan. This struck me for several moments, and I was, <laughs> for several years, in fact, it's taken me to figure out exactly what we were talking about in that conversation. Through the processes that have taken place over the last seven years, it's become clear that this idea of peace agreements and mediations are being used very effectively to silence opposition by bringing them into a ruling regime and then making them irrelevant thereafter. So we see peace processes used in a very sophisticated manner um, that actually works to reduce the revolutionary pressures that are coming from society. And I think this is one of the biggest lessons we have to learn around how we're engaging in formal conflict management through, through negotiation, um, is that we are failing to see changes in the ruling regimes, we are, we are failing to see changes in governance, and we're missing something here. So I wanna talk about some of these things, and I'm gonna give you kind of my three lessons that has emerged from, from working on these issues in the Sudans. Now, overall, I have been accused many times of being somewhat cynical um, in my approach to discussing these issues, but I think we really need to have a great degree of realism when we talk about the nature of the state that we're dealing with in the Horn of Africa in particular. Uh, to a point that that's something that Greg was actually saying around the nature of the state being a very big part of the problem. Central to the problem of conflict in the Sudans and in Ethiopia also is the nature of the state. It's a system of governance which produces violence. Violence doesn't happen as an aside. It doesn't happen as an unintended consequence. Violence is produced by the systems of governance which remain unchanged by the processes of conflict management and mitigation. And we have to realize that is forefront in this. These are governance crises and need to be addressed as governance crises at their core. But instead, what you find often around the, the narratives that develop around these countries is that it's about ethnicity, or it's about identity, or it's about survival over resources, be it climate-induced displacement, be it personal leadership contests. We use multiple language to avoid the fact that we're talking about governance and we're talking about rights and responsibilities between the state and their citizens. Part of the reality that we have in 2022, as is just being said, we are seeing less money, we're seeing less political capital to address these crises, um, particularly from our, our partners outside of Africa. We have more displacement and more humanitarian need in 2022 in the Horn of Africa than we did at the height of the conflicts that we've had in the region over the last five years. Displacement in South Sudan has doubled and doubled again since the signing of the peace agreement. We're about to see famine declared in Ethiopia as well as Somalia on a devastating scale. And there is not gonna be enough money to take care of the humanitarian survival needs, never mind extending out the available resources to do much more. There is not money for democracy and governance programming. The US is not funding it anymore. UNDP is barely touching it. The idea of doing large scale democracy and governance programming, there's just no donor appetite for it. That is the absolute reality. So what we see, we're gonna see some money for humanitarian, we'll see money for training and equipping armies, but what are we gonna see for political party development? What are we gonna see for actual reforms within a, a structure and system of governance? There's very little appetite to address these issues. So moving to the first slide then, onto the three points I'm actually going to make. Uh, the first one is peace agreements can reduce violence, but they also set the parameters for the next war. Um, my, one of my 
pet annoyances, apologies Antony, was the term root causes. Uh, when I used to chair an analytical meeting in Sudan, I, anyone would say root causes, I said I'll throw my flip-flop at you because it's not an analytically useful term. Um, what is the root cause of conflict? These conflicts change and the next conflict is set up by the peace agreement in itself very often. And we see this particularly in the Sudans quite clearly. So here you have just a simple graph of battle engagement by actor in, in South Sudan. As you see there, when the Khartoum peace agreement was signed, we saw a dramatic reduction in battle deaths in the, around the country, a dramatic reduction uh, in overall kinetic energy around the country. What we did see, though, um, alongside that was an increase in localized insecurity, an increase in displacement, and an increase in the different types of actors competing in the space. So we resolved one conflict and we set up a whole different conflict system. Very interesting to see. You see the same thing that's happened in the Sudan also. I'll give you three examples of this. So most of us are familiar with the Comprehensive Peace Agreement that was signed that ended the war within Sudan um, and led to the creation of, of South Sudan. The CPA was only signed between the NCP, the ruling party in Sudan, and one branch of the opposition in South Sudan. So we had an inclusivity problem from the start that then was the war that started in South Sudan in 2013. So you kind of see how the seed carried through there. Within Sudan at the moment, we've got the Juba Peace Agreement in play, which is really between the Sudan Revolutionary Forces, which are largely paramilitary leaders, and security elites in Khartoum, setting up again the rounds of violence we've seen bursting around the country there, particularly in the East and the West. So we have a major inclusion problem with peace deals that then create the ability for the next conflict to go. A part of the problem with that is that the peace agreements are usually structured as power sharing between belligerents, and these belligerents are usually paramilitary leaders, and they usually lead ethnically defined paramilitary groups. And your way to access power is through power sharing. The way to get to the table is through having enough people of your ethnic group able to use violence to control the population around them. So you're incentivized to gain access to political power through the use of violence on the ground. That also means, though, that these peace agreements then set up an agreement between security elites um, with very little participation outside of the security elites and very weak constituencies that are represented by them. With the revitalized agreement on the, rev on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan, uh, civil society was included as part of the peace process to try and offset some of these issues. But it created a dilemma further down the line when civil society signatories to the peace deal as of several months ago have stepped out of the peace deal and said that the belligerent parties are not implementing it. And the international community writ large has struggled on what to do with that. So diplomatically, you can't support civil society saying that the peace deal is not working because the peace deal is the only game in town. Yet what do you do when your actual inclusivity partners are saying this thing isn't working? Puts a real dilemma on it. The other problem of power sharing done in this manner is that it actually destroys popular legitimacy and undermines the ability for grassroots democratic institutions to grow or survive. So it reinforces this idea that control is centralized in the military and security apparatus. Let me give you an example of this. So the power sharing agreement, um, let's, let's take South Sudan for fun. The power sharing agreements in South Sudan included provisions on all percentages throughout the civil service of which different parties got representation throughout the civil service. So that meant that the president now in his personal capacity as the executive appoints all state governors. State governors used to appoint their deputies and their own administrations. They no longer do that because the percentages are dictated in the peace agreement, which is appointed by the presidency. So the president appoints the governor, the deputy governor, county commissioner, all the way down to prime administrator, totally centralizing everything through the line of the executive. So what was there that was an existence of people being able to make leadership claims on the ground has all been swept away. We've seen the government then fire the chiefs who were, any chiefs that were still democratically elected have been removed from power and the chieftaincy system absorbed in also into the central authority. 
what this does also that I think is, is damaging, is even further damaging. You have the damage to dem democratic institutions, you have the damage to legitimacy and the ability of people to select their leaders, but you also have the reinforcements of the military, the military aristocracy as the ruling class and as the only way for anybody to access power. So there's no way to break through that divide the whole time. We also see then that peace agreements directly link to increased recruitment all the time. So we've seen this, we saw this in Darfur, the explosion of recruitment in Darfur since the signing of the JPA, the explosion of forced and, and, and civilian recruitment that's happened in South Sudan since the signing of the Arachsis. So at the time these agreements are signed, it's usually with people in weaker positions. They use the agreements to mobilize their forces to be able to contest through violence. Next slide, please. <laughs> There's the great saying, everyone always says, well, you know, Lauren, all of that given, a flawed peace process is better than no peace. I think we need to dis dismiss this notion. I do not think that a flawed peace process is better than no peace because these flawed peace processes, particularly because of the way they centralize power, are not addressing any of the issues that citizens are claiming to be required for peace. So we, we can say that, well, there's good enough. It'll be good enough if we just get some security forces integrated. It'll be good enough if there's an election that just passes muster. But good enough doesn't actually change the situation on the ground. So many times in Sudan and South Sudan, you travel outside of the capital and you talk to people about the peace, and they say, well, there is no peace. The CPA was not peace. Our Oxus is not peace. The JPA is not peace. What are you people sitting in your rooms talking about? That is not our lived experience of this. So we have to realize that the flawed peace processes do not actually take us forward. This little map here um, indicates all the political disorder that exploded around Darfur, uh, both during the negotiation and just after the signing of the Juba peace agreement. What was the, there's several interesting things that came out of this. One was that even while the Darfurian rebel leaders were negotiating in Juba, the IDP camps were full of protests of citizens in the IDP camps saying those people do not represent our needs. They do not represent our interests. And that you saw the people would protest, particularly in the camps, they would be attacked by militias because they're making demands that'll affect the space around them. And you had the spiral of violence kicking off there. Um, I want to just, Lauren, yes, okay? sorry, are we done, done? One minute, two minutes, give me two minutes and I'll be done, I promise. Um, one thing I think that's important to highlight here also, why the reason, another reason I say a flawed peace process is, no better, is not better than no peace is because what these peace processes do to your reformist agenda is incredibly damaging in the long run. I'm going to read you a quote from a, a Sudan analyst who was talking about what's happened to the resistance committees who were central in bringing down Bashir. He was saying the resistance to committees today have to face up to a vengeful coercive state apparatus and it's a state apparatus that is plugged into and part of a global security order that binds Abu Dhabi, Cairo, Tel Aviv, Riyadh, and Washington together. And it's a global security order that favors sectarian authoritarianism, sectarian and authoritarian structures, and that rules through sophisticated military industrial complexes. So now you as a citizen in Sudan or South Sudan, that is what you're actually up against. That's what's being created for you. Um, I will stop there for the sake of time, but happy to talk more as we go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. I, I think you're putting the issues squarely on the table. Um, they, they are issues that uh, a number of us have raised for a long time as well, but you bring it up very vividly for us. When we question our conflict management system that relies on peace agreements, as the only way forward, even though those coming to the peace table may not necessarily want peace, may not necessarily be democratic, and that the outcomes, therefore, um, are those that we see. But, but really bringing it out for us, especially when you say that the nature of the state 
itself, the systems of governance itself, produces that violence. It is not a byproduct of it. It's very integral to the very state systems that we have in Africa. And so if you want to talk about conflict management, we have to talk about the kinds of state systems that we have. And I'm sure we'll come back to that again. You can see I do get very excited with that. <laughs> it's something that I am passionate about, as Lauren is. Um, so Fonte, uh, you're gonna take us to coups now. ECOWAS was, was leading on democratization, and I think it speaks also to what Lauren has, has raised here. ECOWAS was leading on democratization in Africa and on the, the regional peace and security infrastructure. Why then the resurgence of coups, and what are the implications of this for the broader lessons uh, that we need to learn going forward? Yes. yes. So um, no, thanks, um, Cheryl. Fascinating question. And I think um, I would pick up from where Lauren left off with a number of observations. Um, we focus on coups in West Africa without necessarily also focusing on the changes in constitution and the instrumentalization of constitutions. And it's interesting to juxtapose the popularity of the coups we have seen over the past couple of years against the social protest against changing constitutions um, to enshrine the thir third termism in West Africa. Um, what we see um, in the coups in West Africa, in, in ineffective governance responses to growing inequalities, um, insecurity, corruption, um, and the crystallization of state capture which provide the material and the political preconditions for social protest. And these very conditions then provide the conditions, uh, um, support uh, military takeovers. Now, I think it's worth setting the context um, and underlining a few things. Look to the countries in West Africa that have experienced coups over the past couple of years, starting with Mali. Um, Mali um, on, underwent its um, coup in August 2020 with a second coup in May 2021. Um, the previous coup in Mali, in fact, had taken place in March um, of 20, 2012. And between that coup, which was led by um, Yaya Sanogo, and the coup that we just saw by um, the Goita faction, um, we, can see, we could see just one president, in fact, governing through that period. Um, and I'll go to the next coup. Um, if you look at um, Guinea, for example, um, you look at the coup that uh, brought um, Mamadi Dumbuya to power. Um, it takes place in September 2021. And between the coup um, by Musa Dadis Kamara in December 2008 and September 2021, we equally had one president. Um, and Burkina Faso, same case. Um, a coup brought... Um, a coup destabilized the Compaore government, um, brought Rock Mark Christian Cabore to power through an election, and he was taken out by a coup a couple of years later, so in, in January this year. So there are a number of observations that could be made um, in this context. The first is, an, in, is the observation that um, anocrasis, which are these spaces, but transitional spaces between authoritarianism and democracy are inherently instable, and we are seeing that in West Africa. The second observation is um, one of transitional coup recurrence vulnerability in countries which have previously experienced coups. Um, and these result from the challenges of establishing effective civilian control of the security establishment within one presidential cycle and it points to security sector governance challenges and transitional, in transitional political context. Um, the other observation to make is the broken bridge between security sector reform on one hand and security sector governance on the other. In context where there is generalized insecurity due to um, terrorism and violent extremism in places like Mali and Burkina Faso, and um, which is slightly different from what we saw in Guinea, um, which was um, the result of more of elite rivalry. Um, the third observation to make uh, is the challenges in consolidating constitutional governance in one presidential term, and the challenges of consolidating a culture of democratic governance 
in um, these countries as well. And there's a lot that could be said um, about this specific context. But I think going to the implications um, would be key here. Um, the implications of the coups we are seeing in West Africa, which seemed to have um, crystallized democracy, are clearly the necessity to improve multidimensional governance. And this um, speaks again to some of the points which Greg raised earlier. Um, there is also the necessity to ensure constitu that constitutions are inviolable. Um, in West Africa, we still have governments which over the next couple of years um, would try to violate their constitutions and go for third terms. Now, the way in which ECOWAS reacts to those um, has to be commensurate with the way they react to coups as well that, takes, that, that take place. Um, the third imperative is one to bridge security sector reform with security sector governance. In fact, if you look at all of the presidents who were um, sort of subject to successful coups in West Africa, none of them had a military background. However, if you go to the countries where um, you had um, former military leaders um, put in a security, securitized um, form of governance, they have a, a longer lasting power in the region. And um, it's not uncanny to actually look at um, Cote d'Ivoire, for example, um, where the president puts his names his brother to um, the position of Minister of Defense as a way of consolidating power. And so there is clearly a conflict between the political establishment or the plutocrats within the system and the securocrats within the system. And those securocrats generally have a longer lasting uh, grip of power because they opt for a greater move towards authoritarianism than democratic governance. Now, if we shift from the national dimension to sort of the regional dimension, um, we have already spoken to the necessity for an equitable application um, for, of norms, whether with changing constitutions and violating um, the uh, third term and promoting third termism or um, countering coups. But more importantly, um, there is a need to look to the responses that are also brought to bear when coups take place in West Africa. And that calls for an interrogation of the sanctions regimes which are put in place. Now, there are many um, devices that have been um, developed to um, sort of circumvent the sanctions. So if coup leaders um, are going to circumvent sanctions, how effective is the regional bloc going to be in holding them to specific transitional processes? And at the end of the tr these transitional processes, generally there's ex the expectation that there would be elections. But then when elections are devoid of um, the democratic content that they should, they should deliver, what exactly is the promise for citizens and what is recourse for citizens in this country, in these countries? So it raises important questions about how in bet between two elections, you build up accountability, you ensure that representation does not lead to state, state capture, and you ensure the legitimacy of the state and state-society relations are strengthened as well. Um, as part of the resolution um, or, or the transitional process, there's the question that comes to mind as well about the, the capacity to effectively mediate transitional processes. We, has, we have seen a couple of breakdowns in mediation of these post coup transitions in Mali, for example, where through a series of consultations, they come up with a five-year um, calendar while the regional economic community says you should not go over 18 months. How do those two perspectives actually bridge if the Malians think and believe that they need five years, in fact, to put the institutions in place to ensure that governance norms that are representative of the people are actually put in place. So there is that dissonance there as well that would need to be dealt with both at the regional level in West Africa, but also at the continental level. And I think importantly, in a lot of the spaces where we are seeing these schools, there's the need to interrogate um, the reconfiguration of um, the foreign security presence, um, particularly in the Sahel. We have seen a lot of anti-French sentiment which has delivered on the entrance of um, some foreign security actors um, to, 
who are generally um, incapable of providing the kinds of um, security services that are required by the citizens. Um, and it does not necessarily ergo well either um, for democratic governance in these spaces, but that would have to be dealt with as well um, within the framework of Afri African protocols against the use of mercenaries. Um, we also need to look to the economic implications of coups and unconstitutional changes of government and the sanctions regimes that accompany them, particularly in the post-COVID context. Um, we have seen most of the countries in West Africa actually see a reversal in economic gains, which puts pressure on these countries and which could be um, read as a fundamental driver of the coups that we are seeing in the region as well. So how do we effectively ensure that this, these countries, despite the unconstitutional changes of government, move towards the attainment of the sustainable, sustainable development goals while at the same time um, being under sanction? So these are key questions to ask. Um, and in a lot of these countries, you see the public discourse actually getting really divisive um, because the people um, or the society, different societies within these countries see themselves as victims of norms which do not necessarily protect them when they are faced with authoritarianism. And so when coups take place, they face sanctions and they bear um, the greater brunt of the sanctions than those in power. So how do we effectively lead these transitions and get the people to actually support transitional processes that are the product of a mediated resolution between states, regional economic communities, and international partners. Thank you. Thank you, Svante. Um, so putting security sector reform and security sector governance back on the table. That is something that over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, especially on this continent, um, we haven't had much discussion around. It was, um, I remember with, with Lauren at the RSS how we were dealing with security sector governance quite centrally, and then it just disappeared off the agenda. You are indicating the need to put that back on the agenda again. Noting that security cats have a longer lasting grip on power, that elections, I, I, I note this statement because I think it's loaded, that elections are devoid of democratic content. And I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that again for us a little bit uh, later. But also that between elections, it is the lack of accountability, uh, the lack of ensuring the legitimacy of the state, the lack of the state to actually deliver elite arrival retaking place. Um, and so the context uh, um, is there ripe for these kinds of uh, authoritarian transitions that we are seeing. Uh, happen right now. Um, I am now moving to, to you, Faith, and uh, you're going to deal with external actors. Uh, so the question would be, we have so many external actors engaged in peace and security on the continent. Uh, what is the value add if we're still seeing so, so much conflict take place? Um, why the backlash against certain countries? Uh, Fante raised this as well. But I want to ask another question and link it to what is happening right now in, U in Ukraine. Um, how will this uh, conflict or war between uh, Russia and Ukraine impact on support for continental peace and securities? Uh, what are the prospects and challenges of the shift in the global attention to conflict in Europe? What does that mean for us? Thank you so much, Hale. I'll try and address this very two, um, I'd say very loaded questions, but I'll try and address them in a concise manner. So let me start with the bigger question, the first question that you asked about external actors in Africa, right? And the, the, I think as a starting point, we need to understand the context in which we are operating in. So this idea of 
the strategic appeal that Africa has, and we all know about, you've, you've seen the cover of The Economist, moving from a dark and hopeless continent on one extreme to a rising Africa on the other, and in between raises very um, interesting questions about what shifted. So this idea of the economic growth of Africa, the strategic appeal of Africa, just loaded with vast uh, deposits of natural resources, being able to feed into the, not only the energy needs, but the resource needs of um, major powers. That you can't ex um, extricate from this conversation. But touching on something that also Fonte said about, now we are seeing almost a shift, right, a palpable shift in which we are now firmly back in the area of strategic competition, if we ever left, is my point. Mm -hmm. Because when, we, when, you, when you talk about strategic competition in this case, you almost get a sense that there's, there's been a, a, a backdrop of intervention fatigue. So this idea of moving away from your Afghani type, Iraqi type in, uh, interventions, long drone wars, costly wars, forever wars, that fail to realize the transformative objectives um, of the interveners. So when you begin to ask to look at that also, picture, picture this al um, alongside almost a tempering of the hubris of the liberal peace model. So this, uh, Lauren and talked about the issue of peace agreements failing to deliver a sustainable compact of peace. And this also leads to an increasing questioning of does the liberal peace model work? Does it deliver on what it promises, particularly when you look at the, the longer term um, objectives, the longer term aspirations? So what do, you have in, what, what do you have in response, obviously dictated by reality on the ground, is that there's been a lowering of ambitions to a large degree. And this lowering of ambition has sort of steered external actors towards a prioritization of your security imperatives. And I argue this is why you see, for instance, narratives like your stabilization coming to the fore, your securitization dynamic informing a large um, aspect of, of their responses. So that's the first aspect, the costly intervention element. The second, um, I think, in interacting dynamic here is the evolving nature of conflict. We have this idea where there's, there's been a regionalization of conflict. When you look at just the intersecting fault lines, the Sahel linking to the Maghreb, linking to the Horn of Africa, these, these are intersecting uh, fault lines. But also at the same time, there's also been uh, very complex drivers that have come to the fore, and Lauren touched on some of them, which is this also idea of this, this very complex nature, the evolving nature of, of conflict, armed conflict, has also tested the metal of some of the responses, tested the metal of your comprehensive approaches, development, uh, defense diplomacy, and also tested the metal of your integrated approaches to, to crisis and conflict. Then there's also another trend, I, I, I argue, that begins to inform the responses also of external actors on the continent. And this is the, the, the turn towards pragmatism, your pragmatic approaches. Obviously, when we think about the notion of pragmatism, what comes to mind is, like I said, something to address the rising costs. So you want a low cost alternative. You want a, a, an approach that's being seen as more realistic in the face of your mounting um, challenges. You're trying to evade your wicked problems. You're trying to evade your coordination problems. You opt for what would be would be termed as a pragmatic approach. And this, this you can argue, is also um, linked to the broader appetite for your so-called high, hybrid approaches on one hand. But interestingly, on the African continent, and this is something I would open up to the floor also for consideration and de debate, is whether there's been a trend towards Africanization of African security. And for instance here, when you talk about the APSA component, did APSA present a leverage for external actors to latch onto in delivering um, uh, security needs, security resources to the African continent. So that idea of Africanization, has it been sufficient? And also the other question that I said is, this, do the security imperatives of the external actors align with the, 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 the priorities, the needs of African actors on the ground? And why I bring up this question, for instance, is, and here I want to use an example that um, I'm, I'm well familiar with. Think about Libya. Uh, post-intervention. So NATO came, um, oversaw the, the no-fly zone, 19, resolution 1973, and left. What did you have happening in between? You had this almost a waning of international interest. Up until 2015, 2016, with the migrant crisis, with the, the ISIL gaining a foothold in Syria, then you begin to see a surge again in, in uh, attention on, on the Libya and uh, the larger Mediterranean um, sort of region. So that's a very interesting question about alignment um, of interests. Uh, 
two more points, I think, in this regard, is the question of geopolitics as a trap. And why I'm framing it as a trap is that because when you look at cross-cutting themes, so whether be it your European Union, China, the US, uh, Gulf actors in terms of, of peace and security on the continent, there's almost inherently tagged along with it is a sphere of influence logic that seems to pervade their responses. Sometimes it will not be necessarily framed as a sphere of logic, but when you look at how intimately they're, they're linked to the question of history, your question of, of um, economic interest, your question of your strategic interest, it becomes very hard to shed off that level of the sphere of influence. And this is perhaps what's up for question with regard to the Kwanza um in, in the Sahel and in the, in the Maghreb. There's also, uh, the, the geopolitics question is also important because think about the Horn of Africa here, if I can use it as an example. Back to my argument about intersecting fault lines. Just how the Horn of Africa um, crisis and, and, and is being interlocked with the Indo-Pacific shift. So when we, when we talk about that focus on the Indian security, this very intense desire to actually make sure that you, you, you securitize your resource needs, you, you protect your supply lines, you protect your sea lines of communication, and your, your crucial maritime chokeholds. And then think about how the BRI also has a security comp component. So hence, back, we are back again to the, to the strategic competition point I raised earlier. We are back again to the question of a zero-sum approach. And when you look at the, this broadening array of the strategic partners, we also have having to find now, when we talk about competition, the various actors on the continent, now external actors I mean, uh, to be specific, find themselves having to up their game in, in, in competition with the other. So when you think about, um, in the, and here um, I'm willing to open up also for discussion, the EU packaging, the, the, the global gateway, almost as a counter to China's BRI. Or you have the B3, B3W also coming as a counter to BRI. So you're locked in, you're beholden. Africa seems to be beholden to a very crude game of geopolitics. And lastly, I think we also, we also have to navigate the very tricky politics, the politics and the policies of self-interest and pragmatism. So I've, I've raised the pragmatism angle um, initially, but you also can shade off the, the self-interest uh, angle, and here is what I'm talking about. You need to secure your supply chains, your strategic commodities, of which um, majority obviously have happened to be, to be in this um, continent, so in terms of just location. So I think I'll leave it at that, um, Cheryl, and I'll, I'll, I don't have time to answer your other question it's, unless you're giving me two minutes about <laughs> Ukraine, <laughs> but I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. <laughs> I am listening to you, um, and I'm thinking that um, you're actually painting a picture here that despite all the rhetoric over the last two decades, we really have still been busy with realpolitik, um, with um, you know, geopolitics, self, self-interest still at play, spheres of influence, still the kind of uh, politics we associated with, with the Cold War, actually. Huh? Um, and I, I think we can open that up for, for debate as well. Um, noting also then the, the, how this impacts us, the turn towards uh, pragmatism, uh, these narratives of stabilization, and I think it links up to an earlier point that Lauren made of the blunting of the revolutionary zeal almost uh, in, on, in or on this uh, continent of ours. I think we've had a very insightful um, comments made by our panelists. I'm going to open the floor for, for 20 minutes or so um, for, for any of you. And let us see the people online as well, Ron, so we can see if there are any questions coming uh, from the people who are online. Any questions? Frank? Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, just to introduce, I'm Frank Lekaba from the Northwest University. Uh, on, I have a question or maybe a comment to Dr. Akum. That isn't it that uh, in, most of, in most cases, the focus is juxtaposing, juxtaposing transitional governments and post-conflict reconstruction. Where else, in transitional governments, 
the focus is on building the legitimacy of government, preparing uh, government for the elections and stuff like that. So a lot of t a lot of energy is focused towards elections more than the reforms, the actual reforms. And I think that takes time. And when, once elections are held, AU and, and direct actors tend to, to withdraw. And this now gives uh, or paves a way for recurrence of conflict again. Uh, just a point on that. And then on Lauren, just one, one point, the, the civil society actors in, in, in ensuring that peace agreements don't only reduce violence and set parameters for the next war. It, shouldn't it be that they be encouraged to have international linkages where if the, they don't have that space in the peace tables, they can you know, have that international linkages mobilization, maybe with the AU and, 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 and Rex to put up these issues there instead of the, at, the, at the negotiation tables, mediation tables. Thank you. Uh, Jans? Thank you very much um, also to the speakers that have really given us great insights into um, not only the program, the project, but also to what's happening in the, on the continent. Um, Lauren, I would like to address a question or two to you. Um, you referred to the agreements as almost like a legalization of peace, but the institution or the legalization then of criminals, in a sense, um, or of bad governance, in a sense. Um, and, and I think there is a fundamental problem that we need to, need to look at, coming then with what uh, Faith said about the, the Africanization of peace and the peace processes. I think there is a, there is a lot to be learned between the, the, the Africanization of it, but also then to, to bring in innovative ways that are to the benefit of, of, of the continent. Sometimes I get the impression it's too much of a rationalistic approach, you know, peace by agreement. Um, and, and I mean, and that creates some of the problems that you have said. My second question is, um, also to you, Lauren, you referred to the military industrial complex, especially within the context of the quote um, that you have read from, from one of your Sudanese colleagues. How do we engage with the military industrial complex? And why I ask this is, should we not ask the question, what are the benefits of peace? When last did we have a discussion about the benefits of peace? It sounds so simple, but I think that that is not only about conflict prevention, I, I think there needs to be a different narrative. I can't recall who exactly spoke about the different narrative that needs to be, uh, I think it was Greg, to, 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 to create a new uh, imagination of, of what peace should be. And that comes down then to, to the kind of agreement that is made. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Charles Van Niekerk from the Witt School of Governance. Um, it's basically directed towards Lauren. If peace agreements set the parameters for the next war, would it not be useful to use the following two structured analytic techniques to increase the possibility of a more lasting peace? The one is an indicator development for the next war in the context of those elements of the peace agreement that may set the parameters for the next war. The second is a pre-mortem analysis when the peace agreement is formulated. In other words, let's jump ahead a couple of years and war breaks out again. So you do this when you're formulating the peace agreement. And you say, okay, we're a couple of years ahead and there's, a, there's been a failure. So anticipate the elements of a possible failure and address them upon formulation of the peace agreement. Honorable Chair, uh, my dear colleague Rina, uh, keynote speakers, colleagues, uh, uh, my name is Pavel Rezac, I am ambassador of the Czech Republic uh, with my colleague here. Uh, 
This is not EU flag, but Ukrainian one, the same, same cult, uh, color combination. And uh, uh, I wish uh, uh, to share that whole Europe is now supporting uh, uh, Ukraine against Russian, not invasion, but uh, in terms of international law uh, aggression. Um, I am a lawyer. Uh, uh, graduated uh, in the uh, Faculty of Law in, uh, in Prague uh, with specialization uh, for maritime law, international maritime law, despite the fact that Czech Republic is a uh, landlocked country, not having sea. <laughs> but definitely the terms are uh, similar. Uh, I got, when I got the invitation for today's seminar, it came to my mind immediately to raise the, uh, uh, the question how is the fate of the, uh, of the uh, approved document silencing the guns by 2020, uh, approved year before by, by AU, AU leaders uh, or heads of governments and states uh, in Addis Ababa? So uh, on Thursday at five o'clock, Thursday lies at, at five o'clock uh, early morning, the, my mobile phone gave me uh, uh, some serious information that the uh, regular war has started in Europe. Uh, uh, I really do not need the answer to this question uh, because we are facing right now in the old continent the serious uh, international crime uh, which was started in 2014 by annexion of Crimea and uh, I can share with you that we have had uh, Russian soldiers uh, in my home country, former Czechoslovakia, for more than 20 years and uh, East European countries as well. So uh, this is a problem for us. We need to solve it. But unfortunately, right now, uh, we are in the hands of a uh, minor depressive psychopath who is having green button and he's ready to start a nuclear war and he's ready to destroy our planet. Uh, we, need to, uh, uh, we need to unify, we need to use all possible, uh, possible diplomatic uh, uh, ways how to, how to stop this, uh, this person. Um, I can tell you that uh, the uh, Brezhnev or Gaddafi, because here was Libya, uh, I guess I am only one person here in the meeting room who met uh, Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, uh, and uh, we need to cooperate despite the fact that uh, Europe is across the, the Mediterranean Sea and now we are uh, in Africa. Uh, but United Nation, United Nation is the most important tool how to stop the aggression, how to stop the uh, war, how to uh, arrange the peace around the whole globe. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Vlad we'll Piers, and then Emilia, and then we will answer and take another round, okay? Th thanks, Chair. Uh, Piers Piggy from the International Crisis Group. Uh, I got three quick questions. Uh, First one is relating to external actors. So, so for you, Faith, uh, you talked about uh, competition, perhaps, uh, and the strategic uh, uh, resource thing between China or whatever, or the EU. What about the forum shopping by the actors themselves? And, and would you say something about, about the dangers of that and possibilities of mitigation? Uh, second question is for Lauren. Uh, I mean, we see this in all these peace agreements, the absence of effective monitoring, enforcement, accountability mechanisms. And I'm wondering what space is there? What have we learned about what's possible for, for scaffolding those particular aspects of peace agreements that, that don't allow so much to fall through the floor, as they often do very quickly? And, and lastly, uh, Anthony, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, options and appetite for comparative learning on, on what's worked around developing early warning systems, uh, mediation uh, support, those kinds of things, because it, there does appear to be significant differences between the RECs, but there also appears to be significant resistance from some RECs, and SADC is a good case in point. 
in, in, in terms of a resistance for really building effective institutions uh, from the member states. And we've seen that with the mediation support unit, for example, and uh, uh, with really what we have there completely ineffective. Thank you. Good afternoon, Emilia Howard, Forum for Former African Heads of State and Government, commonly known as Africa Forum. Uh, we recently, it's, it's a wonderful meeting, very insightful, and always, uh, uh, you know, with um, uh, leaders like this, uh, Shadow, <laughs> like you, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, recently, um, our members of the core group for peace and security, Africa Forum for core group on peace and security in Africa, uh, did a report on addressing the future of uh, security and stability in Africa and looking for a new approach to peace and security in Africa. This in support of the African Union frameworks and in support of uh, um, the, the methodolog methodologies uh, and uh, a way of operating, you know, and doing uh, um, diplomatic and, uh, um, and other interventions in the African countries. You know that our presidents are mostly, you know, the mediators uh, of, uh, on the continent. So, um, the main reason, you know, I want to ask uh, for Spain uh, is because our president shared a lot of the, the experiences and insights. Uh, and based on this, you know, um, we made some conclusions uh, that uh, um, the African common position outside, you know, say in security, UN Security Council, uh, it's influenced, you know, especially for Libya, was influenced and not actually, uh, you know, we were not able to put our position on the table. So I would like to ask you, you know, if, uh, uh, if you did some research or if you did, you know, some, uh, um, if you have some knowledge, you know, of how this actually common position is um, operating, you know, outside uh, the, the continent and why this common position is not actually functioning and operating. Secondly, um, Lauren, <laughs> this smiling face there, now I'm going to, um, you know, approach you. I have to be quick, Emilia. Yeah, very, very quick. Um, uh, we, uh, we uh, our presidents were uh, discussed exactly, you know, what uh, uh, you just now, you know, shared with us. Uh, and uh, we definitely thought that if we don't address the root causes of problem in, uh, and crisis in Africa, we cannot reach any peace and stability. One of the root causes you actually mentioned, you know, is the ethnic rivalry in, Ma in, in Africa. The other causes is, uh, of, co of course, um, uh, you know, the conflict uh, is uh, um, not delivering, you know, to the promises which, uh, you know, the, the um, government or leadership makes. And the third problem is the funding, the financial, you know, um, uh, contributions to resolving, you know, problems. In, because from we all know whoever gives the money, that's how after that the flutes place. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think I'm going to just take all the questions now and then we don't come back for a second round because we're running out of time. There was a question here and online, uh, Maram Mahdi has a question as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chidom Tangadura from the Institute for Security Studies. So my first question goes to Fonte, um, and it's on um, the state funding um, and how that links to coups and uh, the what and constitutional coups. I was reading an article that was looking at the shift in state funding the longer a leader stays in power, and it was showing that by the third term, um, more state funding is dedicated towards uh, security sector 
uh, the statutory uh, security sector rather than, uh, and so it's taken away from things like health and welfare. And so it's um, interesting to me how then um, in that case where leaders are spending more of the money on uh, the security sector, they still um, face coups. And then uh, to Lauren, um, it was on, I, I, you mentioned the Zimbabwe um, solution and I, and I do see that your presentation was largely within um, a post-conflict uh, context, but it was interesting for me, uh, two things about how power sharing incentivizes violence and uh, talking about this from a political violence perspective, especially electoral uh, violence where we saw that in, in Zimbabwe and in Kenya what happened is it incentivized people who were outside um, to be violent in the next uh, cycle and how this can be resolved. Thank, Thank you. you. Maram? Hi everyone, um, my name is Maram Mahdi. I'm a research officer at the Institute for Security Studies. Um, thank you all for really insightful and brilliant um, presentations. But uh, my question really goes to Lauren. Um, and Fante knows I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask this because it's a question uh, he's asked me several times and I don't uh, really ever have an answer, which is how do we rein in uh, the dogs of war, especially in the context of Sudan? Um, I won't go back into mentioning the history or the challenges of the last three years, but um, I think it's a really important question in terms of, um, you know, when it comes to a power balance in Sudan and how do we really rein in um, the dogs of war, especially in a country that has a six decades or seven decades of military rule. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I'm going to give all the panelists a chance to either just make one remark or to answer um, the questions posed. Many of them were uh, to Lauren and, and to Faith. I don't know if Greg is still online or not. I, I, I doubt it. No. All right. Antony, one minute closing remark, please. One minute. Yes, one minute. Yay. Um, okay. Uh, Pierre, no. Uh, I can elaborate. Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't think that uh, the, the elaborate um, African peace and security architecture that we've put in place over many years that uh, foresees a role for Rex uh, working hand in glove with uh, the AU headquarters. Um, and consisting of very sophisticated policy frameworks and strategies, early warning, standby force, peace fund, panel of the wise, etc., uh, is producing the results that we want, nor do we learn from the mistakes we make, in my view. And I'll tell you why I think. And maybe, and then I'll stop, because it might be um, food for further thought later on, Cheryl. Um, <clears throat> our ruling elites avoid, for good reason, uh, the very powerful influence that civil society can have in understanding and addressing and resolving or mitigating conflict. Uh, this is not built into these elaborate structures that I've mentioned. And I think uh, that if there's any lesson for me is to, is to open up space for civil society to participate. Allow me one example, one illustration, and then I'll stop. Ten seconds to go. So there's violent extremism in Cabo Delgado. There's a state response. Uh, there's a violent state response. Let's kill the terrorists. Let's have a counter uh, uh, insurgency uh, or a counter terrorism operation. In fact, SADC is very proud to have opened a CT unit hosted by Tanzania. And when I ask SADC what is inside this counter terrorism unit that you've opened in Tanzania, then they're very vague and there's no role uh, for civil society and for the, uh, for the regional research community who, if you bring them together across borders, have much more and deeper and nuanced understanding of the so-called roots of the conflict than ruling elites or states can ever have. And if we don't build the bridge between these two, then I don't see how we're going to silence the guns in 2030. Thank you. Fante? Cool. Thanks, Cheryl, and thanks for those questions. Um, the first would be to speak to Frank's question about um, transitions. Um, 
there definitely would be a concept, conceptual overlap between war to peace transitions, transitions from cool to a return to constitutional order, and transitions in context of violent extremism as well. Um, in each of these cases, um, the responses would have to be adapted to specific realities. And at this point, I think Antony spoke to Agdeg earlier, but often we forget that Africa also has a chatter on decentralization, local governance, and local development as well. And this chapter actually speaks importantly to ways in which you can have internal state building where the center of the state is not necessarily threatened, but its border regions are affected by um, violent forces, particularly violent extremism. And I think we need to pay a little more attention to that. Um, the second point would be, um, and before I, uh, I, and, and I would conclude on this point, um, it normally poses, when you look at two coups on the continent, Sudan, for example, and Chad, these were cases where um, you had long-term military leaders who had traded their camos for civilian outfits and at the same time built securitized establishments. This points to the necessity for adapting transitions in context of coups as well to the specific realities. It cannot be a one-size-fits-all, and I think that's one of the challenges we are facing at the moment. When we try to um, sort of copy and paste responses to coups, um, we miss the mark. Uh, because if you go to a country, for example, like Chad, where a lot of the governors, even during um, uh, Debbie's rule, were actually military uh, men, um, generally you would have to change the sort of, um, in French they would say logiciel, but um, you would have to change the very hardware and software of governance in Chad. And that can hardly take um, 24, uh, 18 to 24 months. However, what can we put in place in those 18 to 24 months to ensure that that process continues beyond the transition? That would be the key question, thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thanks everyone, I'm gonna try and address these a little bit systematically. Um, the first question around um, civil society and can they increase their influence through international linkages. Unfortunately, what we've seen in both Sudan and South Sudan is when civil society needed support from the international community, it is politically unpalatable for the international community to give that support. Uh, coming back to this problem of real politic that we're seeing. So we've seen it more recently in Sudan where the Forces for Freedom and Change have been, have rejected UNITAM's initiative to renegotiate because they say the UN's not neutral in the situation and can't be trusted. So we have a real problem when it comes to support to civil society because we're often unable to carry through on that because um, the political objectives overrun it. Um, Joe Unsee, you're still asking me difficult questions after so many years <laughs> that I can't answer all very quickly. But um, let, let's just make a few comments. The question was around how do we engage with the, the military industrial complex um, quite, quite generally. So I think there's some important points around dealing with and addressing this as a class structural issue, which comes to dealing with issues around the political economy and the nature of the extractive political economy. And how do we create changes in the political economy to move it away from its attachment to securocrats and to move the economy away from being run through mutually exclusive hierarchies, usually defined by ethnicity. Um, I think th those are the two key questions that I think we need to engage with. How do we dismantle these systems of patronage that are running through the military and usually by and defined by ethnicity? Um, and that comes to the whole idea of peace building and imagining a different peace, peace space that you speak to. So how do we actually cross the line in everything we're doing? Now, that's the big question at the top, and it's a difficult one to answer at strategic level. The, the problem and critique I have for the international community at large is that we don't even, we don't even address it when there's low-hanging fruits that are easy to address on these things, which is the more problematic side of it to me. Um, so we, we have a strategic challenge, yes, but we're not even doing the basics to address it very often. So a, a South Sudan, a great South Sudan example of it was the IMF bailing out the government in South Sudan to the tune of $300 million in December last year. No peace deal's been implemented, nothing's changed, but here I have $300 million to pay salaries for a government that didn't exist. A huge problem we have, so we're reinforcing the wrong things. 
Um, to Charles, uh, to Charles's ish, uh, question around analytical tools, 100% yes, you could do all of that, and you can do it as long as as long as you're not at the table. Is the is the kind of problem um, that it it's not useful politically to have these conversations. And I'm just going to give one example in answer to this. I was once um, facilitating the US AID's country strategy for South Sudan. So we were doing a process to decide how we were going to spend $800 million um, at, after the signing of the first peace agreement in, in 2015. And I was making the point that we had to talk about the consequences of the peace agreement because whatever aid money was going to be spent was going to be spent mopping up the consequences of the peace agreement. And the position from DC in no uncertain terms is that we back the peace agreement and we do not speak about negative consequences. And that's it. There is no diplomatic space to talk about that. It's seen in zero-sum terms by the diplomatic community. Either you support a peace deal or you don't. There's no in-between in that. So any critique of the deal means that you're not in support of it, and therefore, what are you doing? So it's, it's a very tricky space, and there's just generally a lack of appetite. Piers, your question on monitoring and enforcement and accountability. That was my third point I was going to make earlier on. Um, and the point I was going to make is that there is not and will not be strategic coherence um, amongst the international actors. And when I say international actors, I include AU, IGAD, um, and, and the rest involved, which actually undermines our ability to enforce and, and monitor these agreements in any case. Um, the example from, from South Sudan that you see is that the region is really involved in all these things, but the region is fundamentally not democratic at its heart on many of these issues also. Um, we had the creation of CTSAM, the monitoring mechanism, which was extensively funded by the EU. Um, however, we saw straight away that it was basically an intelligence operation by military intelligence officials from the region who were deployed to CTSAM in the initial period. Because they reported to IGAD, IGAD would use the reports in a way that was politically expedient and not necessarily about accountability. Um, we've got a problem with an accountability mechanism being linked to a political mechanism because those, the, the, the reports, et cetera, doesn't always come out if it's not politically useful. Huge institutional rivalry between particularly the UN and IGAD on these issues. And lastly, we had a lot of work from the, the ceasefire monitors that created a norm and a basis to critique the ceasefire and to actually pull things back. But that was counter to the narrative that everyone needs to sell. So the peace deal includes 15 odd um, peace, the ceasefire includes 15 odd um, indicators, the vast majority of which are violated on a daily basis. Um, but there are very few direct confrontations between the parties. So the narrative of the international community is that the ceasefire is holding because we're not getting direct confrontation between actors because that helps us move towards a post-conflict state of some form. My argument has always been, well, if they're not doing the small things, why would they do the big ones? Um, and we have all these accumulated deficits within that. But um, I think there's a lot more we can do to strengthen that side of things. Um, the, the, sorry, second, nearly last one. Um, Amigo, or the issues of eth ethnicity, I think we, 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 we shall have a much longer conversation about that. But I do not think ethnicity is a root cause of conflict. I think ethnicity is militarized um, and enacted through policies and processes that fundamentally bias people, and that takes form. It's a governance issue. Ethnicity is often a useful way um, to, to, to distract people from, from other things, and also it actually gives form to the biases of governance, not in and of itself. Uh, last two questions. Um, how do we resolve the fact that power sharing incentivizes violence? Another great million dollar question um, that, that requires a lot, more, a lot more thinking from our sides in total. With both that one and, and the question from Maram, I'm glad you both advised this. It's actually Fonte. I'm going to shift this to Fonte actually, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities in what we're speaking about with, with the, the nature of the relationship between civilian and military authority. 
and power in the state and where does power lie in the state and how do you affect change in that? And it was the first thing you said, I'd, I'd actually made such a similar note where you said the social protests then provide the conditions for military takeovers. How do we change that dynamic? And a, a, a lot of that is lying in a different place. And I think we need to start looking at these things through a different light. Is it through, Greg was pushing ideas of, of looking at the economy and how the economic structures work within that. Is it through something else? But I think there's a lot that we have to consider as, as a driver on the continent at the moment there. Thank you, Lauren. Faith, one minute because we're running out of time horribly. Yeah. Uh, so I'll address the question of whether this sort of uh, mishmash of approaches is, is uh, fostering uh, almost a forum shopping to one, uh, one degree, and also the question of ad hocism in terms of moving forces away from your regional security organizations towards ad hoc um, collections like your, it could be your uh, multinational joint task force or your G5 Sahel, because that raises also interesting questions about the credibility, legitimacy of, for instance, your African peace and security architecture. Mm -hmm. But one can argue that that goes that, that applies to both levels. On one hand, yes, you have the external actors who are gonna foster that forum shopping. But on the other hand, also, the ball is in the, in the court of the African actors. Because the, the, the very fact that, for instance, you had the EU reconfiguring its approach, moving away from your African peace and facility, opting for your European peace facility, was to address this very question of, we need to be able to allocate resources to fund you know, your lethal instruments to the theaters of, of conflict. So it's, it's addressing that question. That's why I say it's almost a two-level um, game with the question of ad hocism. But in a positive way also, I would say the broad array of partners or strategic partners also makes us begin to think about options, for instance, like your trilateral security cooperation because you, between the UN, the AU, and the EU in terms of sort of leveraging the comparative advantages, the niche cap capacities of each of those actors in addressing um, particular crisis. So there's, there's also that positive angling, I would say. Very quickly on the question of your African common positions, um, Emilia, I would, I'd want to say it circles back to the, the, the bigger question about your different dimensions of power, right? And the fact that, yes, Africa has this has the, the, the advantage of having the, the political vote, for instance, in the UN forum, yes? But when you look at the, the, the questions of, does it have structural power? Does it have power in terms of where it is in the, in the global econo um, economic, um, inter interconnected global economy? Then you begin to see that the collective bargaining power begins to fall apart, particularly when you, be, when you introduce a divide and rule um, dynamic into that. It, it begins to scatter that approach of, the, the utility of, a, of an, a common African position. So that's just my very abbreviated answer to, 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 to your question. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. I know that we can go on um, making many more points here. Uh, we came here today trying to uh, elicit um, where are uh, the points that we need to be rethinking around our conflict management system. What are the new approaches that need to be evolving and I think we know that it's easy to identify what is wrong. It's far more difficult to begin to strategize around what needs to be done. I think Greg made the point that yes we can identify that we need democratization, democracy, but to get there is a little bit more challenging. Um, Greg also indicated that we need a different currency for security that we need to move away from money and technical assistance towards um, focusing on, on the politics at play here, that we cannot have any more of the Afghanistan style of interventions, that they just do not work. Um, Lauren indicated um, that we need to question our peace agreements I note the point that flawed peace is not better than no peace at all. And, and I hear that, but at the same time, I also want to indicate that we must question our peace agreements and we must question the structuring of our peace table, but that the peace table and mediation is still very important for us in conflict management. 
to questioning who we bring to the table, what is discussed at the table, the kind of outcome of that, is not negating the fact that we actually do need a peace table. Um, then I, I also uh, note the, the systems of governance and how they produce violence, and that takes us back to something that we've been saying for a long time since the 1950s on this continent. If we don't deal with the nature of the state itself, everything else simply becomes band-aid. The state itself produces the kind of conflicts that we see. Fonte stressing the need for security sector governance, effective accountability, accountability, the restructuring of our state society relations, um, and the need to question um, the forms of democratization and governance that has taken place on the continent. I noted the point about um, ethnicity and whether it's a root cause or uh, simply being instrumentalized um, in politics. And that has always been a debate um, in, in, in politics on the continent. Um, faith, uh, you know, noting whether the liberal model is still applicable here, is it really working? Um, noting out the turn towards pragmatism on the continent uh, itself. Um, in, my, in my own head, I scribble down when is learning done, when is it not done, and why. Um, and that is simply because we, we get into meetings such as this. We raise the issues, and a number of, of times, over, over decades, and yet it takes very long to translate the knowledge that is there into actual practice. And where does that gap arise from? And, and I know implicitly where it arises from. It is because the, the human resources, the knowledge that exists on the continent itself is not sufficiently tapped in to bring the kinds of changes that are needed on this continent. Um, we are also here because of uh, an or wanting to strengthen the EU-South African Partnership for Peace and Security. But I think what this particular forum has shown is that the need for dialogue, the need for discussing these issues and really grappling with them um, is perhaps one of the, the key things that this partnership should throw up. Um, and with that, I want to close this meeting. I want to say thank you uh, to our panelists um, who were excellent. Um, thank you to our, our participants, uh, both in the room and online. Um, and then it takes quite a bit to make an event like this happen. So thank you to Ron and his team. Thank you to the EUD. Thank you to uh, the, the team as a whole that put this together. Uh, there are drinks and canapes to be had, I believe. Thank you, out there. Thank you, everybody.